Hey, people of the rap, it's time for another COVID-19 update. It's October 5th, 2020. I'm here with Brit Guest. She's the AIM Fellow at UCLA. She's also an MRAP Scholar. She's actually currently in Gallup, New Mexico, working on Navajo Nation, but uh, we don't have our usual equipment, so it doesn't sound as good as it normally would, but we felt it was time to do one of these updates. She is the author of the Corpendium chapter on COVID-19, along with Crystal Ives and a bunch of experts. So, Brit, what is new with COVID-19 that we need to know about? So Crystal Eyes and I have been actually pretty busy adding in a lot of updates. I think the last one that went out was probably about a month ago. So without further ado, let's get started. So um, I think at this point, we're all pretty comfortable with the fact that if you get a COVID infection, you mount some sort of immunity. And after a unknown period of time, that immunity starts to wane. The next big question though is if you get a COVID infection, can you get reinfected with a genetically different strain of COVID? So you get infected, you recover, can you get it again? So there's not a lot of evidence out there, but what we are seeing in some case reports is, yeah, probably in fact, you can get COVID again. So this study came out of the University of Hong Kong and it was a case report of a 33 year old male who had tested positive and 142 days later tested positive again. And after a lot of analysis of the strain and and, uh, genomic testing, they found out that it was in fact a reinfection and not just persistent viral shedding. So before people freak out, I think you need to understand these are very rare case reports. Millions of people have been infected and we've got just one or two confirmed cases of reinfection. So it sort of proves that most people have actually got you know, an immune response and are not getting reinfected. The question is, how long is that going to last? Is it going to last six months? Is it going to last a year? Is it going to last three years? That's the unanswered question. Early on, we were seeing this in kind of our older patient population that was severely ill, but more and more, we're starting to realize that a lot of our younger patients who may have had pretty mild symptoms are actually having um, a pretty significant amount of cardio, uh, cardiogenic effects. So our job as healthcare workers is really trying to figure out how cautious and concerned should we be about the long-term effects of some of these younger patients that may or may not have um, uh, cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. So this paper, uh, basically it looked at 26 competitive athletes that recovered from coronavirus. Now, the vast majority of them were either completely asymptomatic or had really mild symptoms. Now, I know this is a small study, but all 26 of these otherwise healthy athletes that had a very, very benign um, infection, 15% of them ended up having um, myocarditis, evidence of myocarditis on cardiac MRI. So the big question here is, you know, even in our young, healthy patients, we're seeing that there's a lot of cardiac inflammation. And as healthcare providers, how can we at this point really determine when is it safe for these patients to go back to exercise and competitive sports. With that, there was an article that came out of uh, JAMA Cardiology. And at this point, you know, we, uh, we, have a, we don't have a ton of information on this, but this article tries to give us an algorithm that we as healthcare providers can use to give us some guidance on when it is safe for these athletes to return back to exercise and even competitive sports. So one of the branches of this algorithm is you're young, you're healthy, you get COVID and you end up having myocarditis. Okay, so you have myocarditis, you need to wait at least three to six months, no exercise, strict rest, no exercising, no exerting yourself. You can return back to play if you have a negative troponin, a normal echo that no longer has any signs of inflammation, and a normal EKG that has no signs of any dysrhythmia. So when you return back to play, you're going to do this gradually. You're not going to go out and run a marathon, and you're going to have careful monitoring. If you develop any significant shortness of breath, if you have any chest pain, stop and get reevaluated. So obviously what we're worried about here is that if you've got an actively inflamed myocardium and you're running and there's lots of epinephrine and stuff, you could have arrhythmias, or if you get hit in the chest and you've already got a sort of a pro-arrhythmic state, that could be bad. So we don't want these athletes to get out there. And it can be really hard to stop them because they just want to go and play and exercise. 
So the next branch of this algorithm is COVID. You are a young, healthy athlete. You test positive for COVID and you're completely asymptomatic. So what they say is after testing positive for COVID, wait, wait two weeks, no exercise, and then again, gradual return to activity with close monitoring. The next branch looks at you've got a young, healthy athlete, they test positive for COVID, and they just have mild symptoms. While they're symptomatic, strict no exercise. Once they become asymptomatic, you are then going to have, again, strict restrictions on exercise for a total of two weeks. Now, in order to go back to returning to sport, returning to exercise, they do recommend that these patients get evaluated by a healthcare professional and they get at least an EKG, a troponin, and an echo. If those are all normal, go back to play. Again, gradual and close monitoring of symptoms. Now, the third branch is our sicker patient population. So this is you're young, you're healthy, you get COVID, and you have significant symptoms, or maybe you even have to get hospitalized. The recommendation here is that actually all of these patients should get a cardiac MRI. If that cardiac MRI shows any signs of myocarditis, you go back to that first algorithm and you wait three to six months for any exercise. If the cardiac MRI is normal, you wait two weeks, you have normal labs, you have a normal EKG. Again, these patients are safe to go back to sports and exercise, but gradually monitoring symptoms closely. So the next big thing that's happened since our last update about a month ago is that a ton more studies have come out on steroids. There were three major randomized control trials, the Remap Cap, Codex, and Cape COVID, and they all looked at uh, steroid therapy in critically ill patients. Again, these were all critically ill ICU patients with COVID. Now, the big caveat here is all three of these trials were actually stopped early. Their enrollment was stopped in June because that's when the recovery trial came out and showed how beneficial dexamethasone was. So the enrollment for these studies stopped early. You can imagine a little controversial, but it was considered unethical to continue those other trials because the big trial had been so positive. Those people arguing against that saying, well, you know, often we'll do a randomized trial and then a couple of randomized trials later, um, the results aren't the same. But this is what happened. These different groups decided that they should stop because equipoise had been lost and the evidence that we had suggested that steroids really do work. So what do you do? You go and look at the data you've collected and see if it sort of does suggest that steroids are working and we have good news. Yeah, exactly. I think at this point, we're all pretty much on board with steroids for our sick patients work and we should do it. Um, these studies basically just reinforce that. So this was the CODEX trial. It came out of Brazil. It was a big trial, about 300 patients. And again, these were six sick patients, moderate to severe ARDS. And what they basically did was they randomized patients into receiving dexamethasone or not. And if they received IV dexamethasone, they'd get 20 milligrams IV daily for five days, and then 10 milligrams IV daily for another five days. And what they basically found was the group that was randomized into getting steroids had less, uh, they had less days than where they required a ventilator. So there were 6.6 .6 ventilator free days in the group that got dex, and there were four ventilator free days in the group that just got standard of care without dexamethasone. So again, sick patients, treated with IV dex, seemed to require fewer days on a ventilator. This was in the first 28 days of hospitalization. And I think another important point that uh, was brought up in this study was they didn't see any uh, increased risk of uh, side effects in critically ill patients receiving dexamethasone. So it seemed like a very safe intervention that again, like the recovery trial showed us, is effective. The next one was this remap cap, and uh, the question here was looking at hydrocortisone. Does hydrocortisone improve outcomes in our patients with severe COVID in the ICU? And the intervention here, there were three branches. There was one branch that got seven-day course of IV hydrocortisone, and they got either 50 or 100 milligrams every six hours. Then there was another branch. They only received IV hydrocortisone when they were in a shock state. And then the other branch didn't receive any steroids. Again, this trial was terminated early because of the recovery, but the data that was collected from this trial really suggests that those patients that received IV hydrocortisone had better outcomes and they basically had uh, improvement in respiratory and cardiac support free days. So they needed less respiratory and cardiac support in the first 20, 21 days. The third study that, again, was stopped early is this CAPE COVID. 
And the question here was looking at low dose hydrocortisone and seeing if that decreased treatment failure in patients who were very sick with COVID in the ICU. So for low dose hydrocortisone here, they gave a continuous IV infusion and you got 200 milligrams a day for seven days. Then it was decreased to 100 milligrams a day for four days and then 50 milligrams for another three days. So this was a total of 14 days. And what they found here was they actually didn't see a great improvement in this. So low dose hydrocortisone did not significantly reduce treatment failure. But again, hard to really take too much away from this paper because it was stopped early and it was likely underpowered. So our previous study might show that higher doses of IV hydrocortisone are useful, but it's a little hard to make a con concrete conclusion from this study. So that's reassuring, right? So you stopped the trials because there was a prior randomized trials that said that uh, steroids really do work. You stop your trials, you go analyze your results, and they're all pointing to the same thing, that steroids, at least in higher dose, were working in that uh, patient group. So uh, we're feeling pretty good about steroids in the pretty sick patients. So the next thing I want to talk about, which I think is really important, you know, we are in eight months into this pandemic, and we are so focused on, you know, finding out the best care for these critically ill patients. We're getting them through the ICU and we're seeing more and more patients get discharged, which is amazing. But the story doesn't end there. There's so much rehabilitation for these patients after the ICU. And so we introduced um, into the book this idea, or sorry, into the book chapter, this idea of post-intensive care syndrome. And what that means is it's basically a collection of all the health problems, both mental and physical, that patients experience after surviving a critical illness and being discharged from the ICU. So here we see that 50% of all ICU patients that actually required intubation and mechanical ventilation will develop some degree of post-intensive care syndrome. To kind of give you an example of what this means. So each day of bed rest, actually can result in up to 11% decrease in your muscle strength. So there is a huge amount of deconditioning that occurs here. About a year after being discharged from the ICU, almost 50% of patients develop a mental health illness. So whether that be anxiety or depression, this can be absolutely debilitating. And then one fourth of ICU survivors actually end up losing their job and having a lot of financial instability. I mean, you can imagine that if you've just lost so much muscle strength, you basically have to go through intensive rehab, learn how to potentially walk again. It's gonna be hard for you to even get to your job, drive your car. And then when you get there, you might, you know, you might be suffering a lot of cognitive dysfunction where it's just really hard for you to to process or concentrate, and it's hard for you to just get tasks done. You could lose your job from that as well. So these patients, not only do we need to think about their medical care, but we need to think about their mental health care and all the rehabilitation that goes into really surviving after a severe COVID infection from the ICU. We just added this portion to the book chapter to really highlight not only, you know, we know older patients have more comorbidities and they have higher risk of death, they have a 13-fold uh, higher risk of hospitalization and 630-fold higher risk of death. So eight out of 10 COVID deaths occur in patients that are over 65 years old. So what are some other things that make this patient population special and a little bit more unique? Well, they often present with atypical symptoms, so it's just hard to make this diagnosis. They might have nonspecific symptoms like fatigue, myalgias, vomiting, um, they might not have fever. They might not have cough. In fact, when it comes to fever, about 20 to 30 percent of elderly patients with serious infections don't ever mount a fever. This is probably multifactorial. They just have a lower body temperature in general, but they're also on chronic medications, sometimes things like aspirin that just blunt that effect of ever really mounting that fever in response to a serious infection. I think this is important because, you know, so frequently we use fever as a screening tool to decide if somebody is higher risk for COVID or not. You get your temperature before going into the hospital at work. You get your temperature taken before stepping foot in an outdoor restaurant. They don't mount fevers like the rest of the younger patient population. In fact, the Infectious Disease Society of America actually recommends that you use a modified fever definition for this elderly patient population. 
So if they have an oral temperature one time of 100 Fahrenheit or over, that's a fever. If they have two oral temperatures that are 99 or over, fever. If they have a elevation in just their baseline body temperature of two degrees Fahrenheit, so maybe you look back in their chart, they normally run 97 and now they're 99 today, it's a fever. Take it seriously. And then also our older patient population is delaying care just for other things that aren't even COVID because they're scared to come to the hospital and contract the virus. So we all know that visits to the ED have dropped. In some EDs, it's dropped as much as 42%. Now, during the first two and a half months of the COVID pandemic, ED visits, they declined by 23% for MIs, 20% for stroke, and 10% for hyperglycemic emergencies. So now we have our older patient population who's already at risk of having worsening infections. And now they're not coming to the hospital because they have chest pain, but they're scared. They have slurred speech, but they're scared. So they're staying home with their strokes and semis, which really is just likely increasing their morbidity and mortality. The other thing I want to point out is just a couple of things to consider when you do have an older, uh, older patient that comes to the hospital. If they have non-respiratory symptoms and you really don't think they're there for COVID, keep them separate from your PUIs. Keep them separate from people that you actually think might have COVID. Another thing that, to consider is that these patients are often hard of hearing. Now you just put a mask over your face. You've muffled your voice. They can't read your lips to try and understand what you're saying. So make sure that you speak really slowly, really clearly, and make sure that they understand what's going on. Utilize your social workers or whoever you have in the hospital that can get these people connected with a lot of the community resources that are out there. You know, make sure that they can get their, their medications delivered from a pharmacy. They can get groceries delivered to their house. This will decrease their high risk exposures when they do something like go to the grocery store. And then I think one of the most important things to think about for these patients is that they're in quarantine. They're home alone. Often they have nobody that's coming to visit them because you know they also don't want other family members coming and exposing them to the virus. There's a lot of anxiety, depression, and just loneliness that happens in this patient population. So I wanted to share this phone number. It's the Institute on Aging that offers a friendship line. It's free. It's for anyone that's it, to the extreme of feeling suicidal or literally just so lonely, they just need someone to talk to. It's a great resource and uh, something that I think that we should keep in the back of our mind to make sure that we give these resources and offer these services to our older patients that um, are home alone. I know good advice. This is an American number. There is different numbers in different countries, for example. So, uh, Britt, thanks for your overview. And uh, I think what we're going to be doing is the next live will be an overview of all of COVID, everything we know about the epidemiology and about uh, how you get this and how you ventilate people and all the therapeutics. And we might do that under the C3 sort of banner. We'll get back to you soon. But uh, thanks to Britt, to Crystal, to everybody involved in the chapter, both uh, the physicians and also the people on the back end. Herbert out. All right. Thank you.